cast her within a better foot of it. I just kind of held my breath and hoped for the best. And uh, the, as I passed by, it lashed out at the canoe. Uh, uh, several times, and I just was, I was just terrified. I didn't know what to do. So I paddled, I steered the canoe over to these paper barks and uh, stood up, ready to jump into them. And as I stood up, the crocodile came up alongside me. And as I just got into the first branch, it just shot up out of the water, came up with incredible speed and grabbed me uh, in between my legs here, around here, pulled me down into the water. And um, pulled me under the water, rolled me, it's called the death roll, uh, spin me around under the water. Tries to drown you and also tries to sort of pull you apart, tear you apart. And that was really terrifying. I really thought I thought I was going to die for sure. Al Plumwood is about to return to Kakadu. Nine months have passed since that afternoon. An afternoon spent canoeing alone in backwaters of the East Alligator River in Northern Australia. The afternoon of the crocodile attack. I don't know how long the roll lasted. It seemed to last a long time. Anyway, we came up eventually. Now, because I was hanging onto the mangrove, I was able to pull away from it quite quickly once it slackened its jaws. And uh, I dodged around the back of the mangrove and I climbed the paper bark again. I didn't think I could climb the bank, so I got up into the paper bark. And at almost exactly the same point, I reached almost exactly the same point when it was just like a complete replay. It came up again and it shot up out of all this I've never seen the jaws and teeth and, and got me again. So this time it got me around the, the, the side there. That's why I've got that rather strange looking thigh. And uh, I didn't feel, I felt sort of hot sensation, but I, I didn't have time to think about it because it just pulled me down again and it was all blotted out by the, the third roll. And then I got the idea of digging somehow, I don't know where it came from. I tried to dig my fingers into the mud. I dug my fingers into the mud and I found I could pull myself up the bank by just this very soft mud. I just dig them in and pulled myself to the top. I couldn't believe it. I stood up. I stood up and I ran away. I ran away. Val Plumwood is an experienced bushwalker. She teaches environmental philosophy at a Sydney university. And her first visit to Kakadu National Park was prompted largely by professional interests. This time, it's to be a more personal journey. My life was divided in two by the attack. For years I've been writing and teaching in the cities about the importance and value of wilderness. I always felt at home in the bush and found joy in wild places. But since the attack, I've felt uneasy about being alone out there. Something in my life feels incomplete and it'll be good for me to go back and work through those fears. In Darwin Museum, there's a crocodile called Sweetheart. I've been wanting to see it to help me prepare for a live encounter in Kakadu. Pretty scary. I know that runs 
did, I guess. I wouldn't be prepared to go too close to it. I can't see the nostrils, though. At one point, when it had hold of me, I jammed my fingers into the nostrils. I can't see them on that one. It really makes you think of dinosaurs, though. Beautiful, flecked golden eyes. I got a good look at the eyes of mine when I was standing up in the boat, ready to jump into the tree. Came up alongside me and we stared. Then I jumped into the tree and it came up after me. This might make it easier for me to cope with seeing a live one. I've heard Sweetheart's death was an accident. I wonder what happened. Maybe I'll find out in Kakadu. It's going to be really good for me to come back. It's a way to put that incident into the past. I couldn't do that down south. But here, it'll come into perspective. It won't just remain a frozen memory of something frightening and terrifying. Yes, I think it's really good for me to come back. deep respect for many areas that I've walked in, but Kakadu has become very special for me. Last time I was here, I did a walking trip alone for several days near the Arnhem Land Escarpment. Some call it the Stone Country. It's tremendously dramatic country. It really grips you. And because I was on my own, these feelings were intensified. That's one of the great things about solo walking. I knew this was a strong place, and you had to be careful. But I didn't expect to have that brought home to me quite so dramatically. Sightseeing in day walks are one thing, but I haven't done any long solo bushwalks since the attack. I've only walked with other people. I think I could do it down south all right, but up here, I'm not so sure. I think you've got to respect the kind of power in this country. It's not just a question of appreciating its richness and beauty. We have to take care and realise 
to some extent that we're not always in control. It shouldn't be, perhaps. For me, the crocodile has become an important symbol of all that. It's a very powerful force here. That's how I thought of it myself after I'd been attacked and was dragging myself down the river. I remember then calling out aloud that I'd learnt my lesson. I was sorry I'd come too close. I hadn't paid enough respect. I felt very strongly then that the crocodile was like the spirit of the place. For a while I stopped to check what was wrong with me and found my left leg was in pretty bad condition. It'd been really badly ripped open. I hadn't had time to notice this before that. And uh, I, uh, so it was pretty shocking to look down and see what sort of, you know, it was all sort of kind of hanging open. Um, so I put on a tourniquet and uh, I felt immensely elated, of course, to have got away from it at that stage because I was thought that it was. It had me that I was certain to die. Uh, so initially I was very elated and then I realised I was going to have real trouble getting back to the ranger station. When I got there it was just on dark and there was no canoe. And so then I began to think, well, evidently she's lost um, because the paperback swamp was quite elaborate. There's no clearly defined creek line or whatever to follow. It didn't take us very long to launch a boat and uh, with lights we um, headed on upstream. Well I had to stop after a couple of hours because I, just, uh, I was getting so weak I knew I was going to just collapse if I didn't stop so I had to look for a place to lie down and stop. So I just lay down and uh, waited. And so I cut the engine and called and initially couldn't hear anything much and I moved up a little bit closer along the rocks and called again. And then very faintly in the distance, I could hear what could have been a human. But of course, there's also dingoes and other things that call in the night. I heard this, I heard the sound of a motor and uh, saw lights. And uh, I started to call out. She called out that um, she was badly injured. She'd been attacked by a crocodile. And we were stunned, quite frankly. We couldn't believe this. This was beyond what we had anticipated couldn't even stand, couldn't crawl. Um, so I would probably have died, I would probably have died and probably have been drowned and I may well have died anyway just from the wounds by the following day if he hadn't come out for me. The rest of that terrible night is just a blur. I've been told we went through swamps and flooded rivers. I don't remember much because I was drugged and in shock during the nightmare 12 hour trip to Darwin. The next day, a crocodile was shot. It was two months before I finally left hospital. During that time, my anger at the shooting of that crocodile increased. It seemed such a pointless thing to do. I wonder if the crocodile in Darwin Museum suffered a similar fate. I thought I'd come and see Dave Lindner. Six years ago, he was given the job of moving Sweetheart from a billabong that was popular with fishermen. That's him there, he's got a noose trap around him, behind his shoulders, a bit of industrial building pulled tight around his shoulders. After he triggered the noose by pulling a bait, I'm just, oh, trying to, just trying to noose his mouth so we can control him Gee. with the rope. And, uh, There's a lot of crocodile there. Eh? A stunning thing. Yeah. I mean, it's really a knockout in the museum inside. Eh? It's pretty, I was pretty frightened. If Sweetheart had moved a muscle, I would be out of there in no time. <laughs> He'd um, been chewing boats up for about four years at that time, attacking boats. Did he try to attack the people in them? 
No, no. My own feelings are very strongly that these were territorial attacks, aggression directed at another crocodile. Oh, them sweetheart, I don't think ever probably attacked anybody. You don't really know that. That's interesting, isn't it? It attacked the boats, but it didn't. It, it didn't attack yeah. the people, even when it could have. When you listen to an outboard low revving and you listen to a crocodile territorial growl, it's a very low rumbling growl, mm. they, are, they are similar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they make a, a low rumbling growl. Yeah, throaty sort of a growl, it's no bellow or anything. I thought I heard that from the one that was attacking me actually. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. Only I was That'd told. be interesting if it was though because it would indicate a aggression rather than uh, predatory We'd hit it with flaxidil, which is a uh, anaesthetic, and um, we started dragging the animal over. We had to take it across the billabong to our truck, and at that stage, I would say, sweetheart got a, a belly full of water. Its nose never went under, but it got a belly full of water somehow. I mean, that's you there, is it, Dave? Yeah, that's me. That must have been pretty scary doing that. Oh no, he's well trussed up there. None of the valves that shut in diving or anything in a crocodile work mm. while they're under anaesthetic. They come out of anaesthetic to the point where they can be aggressive and dangerous, but these valves still don't work. You release them into a billabong, they go down and they drown. And that's what happened with this one. But I was very disappointed in the Sweetheart case that such a big crocodile couldn't have been protected out of its... its Sweetheart's individual. death seems to have been pretty unnecessary, like the death of the one that attacked me. Some people find it a real affront that anything should be around that can attack a human being. We wound up having vendettas against the whole species after someone's attacked. Since Sweetheart's death, Dave Linder's objection to moving crocodiles out of their domain has strengthened. For him, the crocodile's the most magnificent animal in Kakadu. He's got a real fascination with them. Crocodiles are part of this incredibly rich and diverse system here. Something I think we've just got to see is having some value in their own right. Not just something you can have or keep or get rid of because it's inconvenient for human beings. Perhaps it's just important that there be things that are independent of humans and aren't just there to service or made over in some way for us. When I was up here last, I stayed with Mick Austin before the attack. Mick's the law enforcement officer in Kakadu. He works in conjunction with the rangers, keeping the park under surveillance for poaching and other illegal activities. He often makes the long drive up to the coast to see a couple of ex-crocodile hunters. They keep an eye on things in their area. With 13,000 square kilometres to look after, I guess he needs all the help he can get. I'm beginning to come to terms with what happened to me. But I still don't know how I'd feel about being alone out here again. The drive out here takes several hours. Mick's told me about Fred and Bob and this place where they'll probably live out their lives. Surrounded by relics of hunting days, they've seen the saltwater crocodiles coming back around the beaches and estuaries of the great tidal rivers. These crocodiles are called alligators by old timers. 
And during the dry season, they're often caught in the nets of barramundi fishermen. The selling of crocodile skins is illegal now, but I've heard that the prices are too tempting for some. Oh, I've done all sorts of stupid things, buffalo shooting and crocodile shooting and all that. Sounds like a fairly hard life. The alligators are not that hard, the mosquitoes are the hardest. <laughs> all night shooting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've tracked them with a spotlight? Or? Spotlight, yeah. yeah. Nothing to it, really. And you just shot them. Are there any problems in it? Oh, sometimes. Hmm? Dangerous? Oh, I wouldn't say dangerous. Rain shot from here to Mike, hmm? Because uh, you, you shoot from, uh, say, a six-foot range, and always tell a killer shot, you, you see blood straight away. Hmm? What about that. this one that, when you fell out of the dinghy, how did that happen? Well, he was shot, but he wasn't shot promptly. He only shot with a twenty two. Oh. He's only wounded. Oh. Only a little eight, nine-foot dinghy. There right. were three of us in it. We all finished up in the water. We fell out of the dinghy and one finished up hanging oh. on the back of me trousers. Right. How big was it? <coughs> all about eight and nine foot. Oh, that doesn't sound too good. Now, how did you get out of it so lightly? Well, I finished up. He had hold of me and I had hold of his nose and he wasn't letting go and I was making sure he wasn't letting go. He wasn't going to get another bite. So we had to find the knife in the bottom of the water hole, water the chest deep. Yeah. I had hold of him by the nose around the back of me behind and put the knife in the back of his neck. Oh, wow. Him. They make up their mind, they're coming, they're coming. No yeah. matter whether you're on your own or whether you're with somebody else. Right. If you're just the unlucky one, well, you're the one that's going to be bit. Yeah, that's sort of how I see it. You're yeah. on your own, way. Yeah. So, there were a lot of them around when you were... when you started shooting, or...? Oh, it all depends where you're shooting, hmm? But most places there were plenty of crocs, no worries. Hmm. And what happened is... As hunters, Bob and Fred had to try and understand the crocodile and its habits. That led to a certain amount of respect for the animal, I guess. But it wasn't much consolation for the crocodiles. Did it stay like that, with all those numbers? Oh, no, you thinned them out naturally. Yeah. Covered um, a lot of country too, haven't you? Down the west coast. It was the skins they were all after. From what I've heard, they came pretty close to wiping out the crocodile up here. By the 1970s, the waterways of Kakadu were just about emptied of them. It was protection that saved them. Now the numbers are increasing every year, and Kakadu's become one of the world's richest crocodile habitats. things out at the trap this morning, over. Well, we've got one, mate. Uh, I can't really estimate its size. Uh, it's underwater at the moment. Over. The National Parks people are doing a lot of crocodile research up here. One of the things they're looking into is what happens if you move a problem crocodile out of its territory. No one really knows whether they'll come back or not. A lump of buffalo meat is the bait that draws them into the trap. This will be my first look at a live crocodile since the attack.
Sound I remember. Dave Linder was the first person to verify what I thought I'd heard during the attack. Okay, you got the strain? Mm -hmm. Yep. Once that tranquilizer takes effect, they'll sew a radio transmitter onto its neck. Then they can monitor its movements after it's been relocated. Oh, I'm pretty sure that the one that attacked me was quite a bit bigger than that one. Well, looking at that. Yeah, if, if it was, Val, you're an extremely lucky woman. Well, you're an extremely lucky woman anyway yeah. to go yeah, through yeah. what you went through and survive. The power that those animals there have got has to be seen to be believed. Yeah. And, uh, but the head is not as big as I recall, but the head and the jaws are quite a bit bigger. It's hard for me to see the total length because it was under the water except when it jumped. Yeah. Away. But the head and the jaws are not as big as I recall from that one. I guess I expected to be more frightened than I am. Perhaps it's good that I'm not especially frightened of that particular crocodile. Though I'm certainly a lot more afraid than anybody else here. I wouldn't be getting as close to it as the others here. Or, or relying as heavily on that anaesthetic they're using. Yes, I think it's good that I'm not really too frightened of it. It's part of getting over what happened. Okay. The whole idea of relocating problem crocodiles strikes me as being a bit worrying. What really concerns me is the idea that if, if something becomes a problem, if there's a conflict with human interests, then it's the human interests that always win out. It seems to me that that's getting the priorities wrong. For me, one of the things that's important to respect is the independence of the natural world. Its capacity to go on in a way that's independent of us. That's a really important part of our relationship to it. But if it all becomes just managed, just another managed wild farm, then that's not the way it should be. Watch its back leg. That's it. Well, he's transmitting hanger. For at least 60,000 years, Aboriginal people have occupied this land with the crocodile. You can see evidence of this today at some of their art sites, which are preserved with the help of the National Park Service. This uh, painting here, can you tell me a bit about this crocodile painting? Well painting going to be there forever, I reckon. The uh, story is, in dreaming days, a long time ago, mm -hmm. it was a man first, you know. Um, and uh, uh, this bloke here was a heavy sleeper. He was sleeping all day. And they tried to wake him up. Said, wake up. Come on, we got to go. He just stayed there. He was sleeping. And then the rainbow bird, he went up there to get the fire stick, you know. He set a fire, crocodile got burnt. Then uh, he raced up into the water. And that's when he got all them blisters, all them lumps on his back. Toby Gangali is one of the traditional owners of Kakadu. 
They've leased the area to Australia as a national park. But Toby and others remain the guardians of sacred places, like the home of the Rainbow Serpent. That thing can go anywhere, kill everybody, you know. You know it's going to be very dangerous for everyone. That's the story, you know. That's why we won't let everybody go up there. I don't go up there myself. One does have to realise that this is a park in which there are a lot of Aboriginal sites and the priorities of Aboriginal people are very important. For my solo walk last year, I didn't resent having to get a permit or having my route checked out beforehand. It's a pretty fair thing to safeguard against bushwalkers infringing on places they shouldn't go into. But it seems to me that the National Parks people have to perform a pretty impossible balancing act here. On one hand, they have to protect Aboriginal interests and the interests of the land itself. But on the other, they have to cater to the encroaching demands of 20th century society. I think some people here aren't paying the place enough respect. They're treating it pretty badly. And maybe as Toby says, they're going to feel its power too. There's an overconfidence there, and a feeling that human beings can do anything for the natural world they like and get away with it. Here we have a World Heritage Park in which there's really an awful lot of development going on. There are major mining operations as well as major tourist development, and that's all having an impact on large areas of the park. I guess the rangers work on the front line of that dilemma. James Walker was one of my rescuers. For an Aboriginal ranger, coping with those conflicting interests must be pretty difficult. One of the legacies of European settlement in this area is feral animals. Wild pigs and buffalo inflict continual damage on this environment, and national parks conduct regular culling operations to try and minimise their effects. A friend of mine has been working with Big Bill Nagy and has arranged for me to meet him. Bill's an elder of the Gagajoo people who gave their name to the area. I'd arranged to spend time with him on my first visit, but the attack put an end to that. A lot of Bill's ideas have been recorded and published, and I've been making use of some of them in my teaching. Bill's a guardian of this place. For the Aboriginal people, it's known as white cockatoo dreaming. They say that long ago, the rock was split open by the shrieks of two white cockatoos as they flew over. Yeah, this one, mullet. See that head? Gee, that's beautiful. Broken. Yeah. Break him off. Break him off when they kill them. They used to take him out on the bank. They used uh -huh. to break him and throw him out. Because they say if you throw them and back in the water they grow again in there uh, this one here a water python i think ah. uh, this one you can hardly see the head uh, another barramundi uh, they used to steal them fish and uh, throw them on a the fire and eat them uh -huh. what's this one here bill rainbow serpent rainbow look at the rainbow, sir. Bloodhead, yeah, rainbow one. That snake, but it used to, used to go through there 
But buffalo been rubbed over here. Yes, I see that. Right up there. Right. Very old. This a place old like this is beautiful, not just for the paintings, but also because of the place itself. Perhaps the people who put the paintings there so long ago thought of it that way too. Not so much as an imposition of human paintings on the landscape, but as a sort of celebration of a particularly significant place. That's the way I like to think of it anyway. The human element just seems to complement the natural one. It seems to be a perfectly harmonious addition to it. For Big Bill, it's really important that the stories and ideas about this land survive. He can see them coming under increasing threat and he passes on his knowledge with great urgency. He's one of the main advisors to the National Parks people on many conservation issues. But he also takes every chance to teach a new generation about the value of his country and the spiritual part of it. I've come to terms enough with what happened to me, to face going out on the water again. Strange feeling. I'm not sure whether I want to see a crocodile or not. I guess it feels all right with Nellie and Peter here. But I hope we don't get too scared if one does appear. What sort of food would you have found in this area? File snake. File snake. Just live on them. Fish, bamundi. Any crocodiles? Yeah. My dad used to get crocodiles around here. What do they taste like? Like, um, just the same as fish. What's that? Barramundi. Ah. It looks like a big barramundi. That's a fish bubble. Yeah. Crocodiles make bubbles too. They're um, bigger and faster. Bigger bubbles? Yeah. Well, if you see one, any crocodile bubbles, tell me. Yeah, okay. When you see a crocodile, do you get frightened of it? Yeah. <laughs> Not as frightened as I am, though. The big ones I'm frightened of, though. What's that? Something in there. Can you see something in there? Just a goanna. Pretty sure it's 
Yeah, it's a fizzy little place where you wouldn't want to sort of encounter a cold out too, isn't it? Try to see any harm itself? Oh, like any animal, if you try and catch it, it doesn't like it, it'll have a go. Yeah, my ex only experience with a crocodile is being inquisitive of people in boats, really inquisitive enough to come up and sort of investigate you quite thoroughly, has mainly been in the wet season. Mm -hmm. I remember being just out here a little while, last wet season, and I was with a person who we were launching the boat from the shore and she fell out into the water. Just yeah. slipped right in the bank, yeah. there was no drama about it at all, but there was a little crocodile, a little bit bigger than this one, about 40 metres or so away, and as soon as he heard that splash, bang, started coming straight towards us to see what was going on. This land brought up crocodile, river, fish. They live together in the water. Desert, kakadu, eh? land for the crocodile because crocodile was staying here many many years he brought up all this so he belonged to this river so you reckon that crocodile it's got a it belongs to this country it's got a place in this country when he grow up he stay so if you go if you, if you shift him to other place he might be worried Worrying. Wants to come back to its country. You gotta come back to the right yeah. place because, like, we make our home, right? Yeah. I live in Cannon Hill, where I got a home there with a crocodile in the water. You make a little bit hollow place to camp there. You take him out of place, you'd be worried about his home. They all the same, these animals, all same feeling. Tree, he can listen. That tree, leaf, he can listen. While you go to sleep, tree you waken. Well, you got pumping the blood, eh? That tree got water too. That is blood. Plenty of people they don't understand this. If you start spoiling this country, what'll happen? Oh, I might feel funny. Worry me, might get worse and worse sick, or might be terrible headache. Because spirit's watching us. If I do wrong, don't look after this country. We like get punished. I knew it'd be good for me to come back to Kakadu. Finally, I feel ready to go walking alone again. When you're walking, especially when you're alone, you get a different sense of yourself, I think, as part of something much larger than you are. But people shouldn't get the idea that this is somehow risk-free. There are risks in this environment. When you do things, I found this when I was here before, there's just that little undertone of fear. I don't think that does any harm. I think perhaps it's a good way for people to measure their place in the natural world. In a safer environment, they very easily get the idea that they're on top of it all. It's much harder here. I guess that's one of the things I really like about this place. I think there's a reason to respect the independence of nature, regardless of whether humans derive enjoyment from it or, or not. That's great if they do, but it's not the only reason for saying a place like this should be left. Be 
Bill said animals and trees are like us. He said the rocks grew here. The rocks are something to respect too. They're not just rocks. They're part of an ongoing process that goes back over huge periods of time, which is the basis of this whole system. We've got to make sure we don't interfere with that. 